Thursday morning of this week, George Wallace left a Washington, D.C. hotel room for a long-awaited press conference to make a long-expected announcement. No prospective candidate of the two existing parties, nor anyone in party leadership positions, have come forward with any indication that there will be any difference in their platforms. No one has suggested that the wishes of the American people will be heard. So today I state to you that I am a candidate for President of the United States. There are, there are, questions, there are questions that many will ask and the American people are entitled to answers. Yeah. Make some wild track on that. Governor, you fellas. Y'all about to get that thing filmed? Are you about to get that thing filmed? George Wallace asked Thursday morning. You are about to see what Governor Wallace was asking about. A candid film report of this man and some of those who support him, recorded over a period of the last six months. It is a distinct honor for me and a privilege, and I feel very humbly, to present to you the former governor of the state of Alabama and a good, loyal American. May I present Governor Wallace to you. And I'm here tonight to tell you why we are in South Carolina and to tell you why that we have traveled the length and breadth of our country and have found so many thousands upon thousands of people exactly as do the people of South Carolina do about the issues that confront the American people. This is a people's movement. It doesn't make any difference whether the major politicians are going to support you or not. If they don't support us in this movement to take back our government and give it to us and let us run our own institutions, those who stand in the way are liable to get run over by you people who are in this auditorium here tonight. <clears throat> After being with him for a couple of weeks and getting acquainted with him, I can't think of a better guy that I'd rather see run. I know one thing, if, if he gets on the ballot, he's going to stir up something, I'll guarantee you. And after you hear him talk, I think you'll agree with me. Columbus Stockade Blues, fellas, we're going to get country now. We're going to get town hall party. <laughs> George Wallace says this is a people's movement. and His singing supporter tells us that George Wallace is going to stir something up. Tonight, we're going to try to see this country as George Wallace sees it and listen to a few of those of you who want him to stir it up. You will be with him at home and on the road, in public and in private, and in those candid moments when he speaks for himself or for millions and perhaps for you. Water, water is a, a problem in some places in the West. We should uh, maybe take some of this foreign aid money and go into countries that, say, spit in your eye and build some desalting plants with it. This is a chartered DC-6 going from Alabama to California, a small part of the nationwide odyssey that has been going on for nearly five years. I want Dr. Adams to set up a booth at Berkeley <laughs> to get signatures on our petition for the presidency. If anything happens to you, why, it'll just be that you, something happened to you for the cause. George Wallace's America is out there everywhere, beyond news clips of pickets and demonstrations in the quieter, simpler world of his Americans, whose political voice to Wallace is mathematically powerful. In California, and the other two parties got 33 apiece, then we would win the electoral vote of California. And if four or more parties run, you could mathematically win on 26% 
of the vote. And so that has led Senator Dirksen to say the other day that because of this third party movement that might spring up, we may have to change the electoral system before next year. <laughs> so at least, so at least you and me have got them talking about changing the Constitution already. It's already had that much force and effect and impact upon the leaders of our two national parties today. George Wallace won uh, anywhere from 25 to 43 percent of the vote in 1964 in primaries in, uh, in uh, Maryland, Wisconsin, and Indiana. And I think it can be taken for granted that he will take uh, a large percentage, not that large, in states of that kind, uh, in many states of that kind, in 1968. Now, the significance of this is not that George Wallace can be expected to win the presidency. It's not that he can be, in my view, expected to win enough electoral votes to throw the election into the House of Representatives, although he himself talks of that prospect. But the significance is that in many states that, that will, will be closely contested between President Johnson and a Republican challenger, uh, Wallace might take anywhere from 10 to 15, even in some cases as high as 20 percent of the vote right off the top. The governor of Alabama lives in this house in Montgomery the state capital and former capital of the Confederate States of America. The former governor of the state is George Wallace, 48 years old, who by law could not succeed himself in 1966, the year his wife, Lurleen, was elected governor. I thought we'd gone to the castle. Well, we are, but uh, we're going to see them first. We just wanted to look around and see the house. Hi. Hi. It was from the Capitol here in Montgomery in the summer of 1963 that George Wallace left for the University of Alabama to stand in the schoolhouse door against federal marshals who had come to enforce a court order for integration. Wallace stood, the marshals won, but Wallace has been a national figure I ever since. Know what you can do, uh, exactly what to do now, other than maybe let them tell you, but uh, a little, Jack, I will. I sure will, and I appreciate you calling me, and I appreciate uh, uh, all you've done for us over the years, and you tell the daughter hello here, and uh, you come to see us too. Okay, Jack, bye. Take care, Really glad to see y'all here. Hi there, boys, how y'all today? Fine, I won't see you well. I know well, you're busy. With this legislation <laughs> session, at the beginning of these travels with Wallace and some of his Americans, we left the Capitol to spend a quiet afternoon with him at home, alone. We wanted to try to define some of the terms, the phrases and thoughts that we would hear at the speeches and rallies, both from him and his people. And here it is, straight, pure Wallace. And a necessity to try to implant any new ideas in California or vice versa, for the simple reason that this country, as large as it is, you will find that people are Americans all over from one border to the next, and basically, they think alike. Uh, this country is not all that diverse in its uh, opinion on basic questions involved. Uh, we find in California that uh, uh, the people voted four and a half to two million against the government controlling the sale and rental of their property, uh, which is uh, the, uh, uh, the, the defense of a property right uh, which is uh, good for people of all races. Uh, it's bad for people of all races to, for the government to take over and say, you must sell your property to somebody you don't want to sell it to or rent your property to someone you don't want to rent it to. And in Alabama, we feel that way. Well, in California, they do. In fact, uh, it's better known there how they feel than in Alabama. We've never voted on the matter at the polls in this state, but the Supreme Court of our country comes along and says that the people of California did not have a right to vote on that matter. In other words, the liberals, the pseudo-intellectuals, say the people. 
If it's anybody that's always talking about the people, it's intellectual. Yet when the people voted a certain way in California because it didn't conform to the way the pseudo-intellectual and the judges thought they ought to vote, they, they of course said it's illegal. Well, when is it illegal for people to uh, determine property rights by a vote at the polls? After all, the constitution of our country and of states are products of the people. The people come first. That's the source of all power. For while the rabble with their thumb-worn creeds, their large professions, and their little deeds mingle in selfish strife, lo, freedom weeps, wrong rules the land, and waiting justice sleeps. God give us men. The former governor of the state of Alabama, and God willing, the next president of the United States, Mr. George C. Wallace. the legislature to pass a law to let the parents vote on who taught their children, even regarding race, and 99.4% of people of both races voted that they wanted teachers of their own race. That's the parents, white and black voting. And you know, they filed an injunction and enjoined the operation of the law, and the Justice Department is arguing that the parents of Alabama have no constitutional right to have anything to do with voting on who teaches their children. However cumbersome it might be, however inconvenient it might be is not the question. The question is, does the people of Oregon through their legislature have a right to let you vote on school teachers if they see fit? But the government of our country argues that a mother and father cannot choose their teachers, but the federal judge is the only one that can choose teachers for the children of our state. And they haven't rendered the decision yet because they've got it in what they call the bosom of the court. And they are now considering uh, the matter within the bosom of the court. And these judges, in my judgment, are trying to think up of some way because I say quite frankly, in my judgment, they prejudged the case already. I think they've already decided before they heard the evidence of the teachers that they were going to rule against it. And so they are getting with the justice of they are getting with the Justice Department to come up with some manner in which they can write a decision that won't sound so bad of saying that parents cannot have anything to do in the teaching of their own children. Well, I think that local people, local doctors and lawyers and businessmen in little towns in South Carolina should have a little bit more say-so about what type of economic and sociological ideas that are being taught to their school, or children. I think that they have a right to continue the same type culture that they believe in and they love so much. And of course, this is, I know, completely frowned upon by other people in other sections and people even here in this state, some feel differently. But uh, I think that people have a right to have their children educated in a way that they know is best for them and in a way that will not destroy the culture as they know it. Uh, I look at it a little bit differently from my husband as a, as a teacher. I mean, from a different viewpoint. We come okay. out the same way. But as a teacher and as a, a future mother, uh, from the teacher's viewpoint, I see local control of the schools being taken away. I've seen this in the classroom. Uh, and I look at it from, from a personal viewpoint, more personal, of course, than my husband. Uh, and as a potential mother, I'd like to see this country return to law and order so I can be sure that my children uh, are safe to walk the streets and that my children uh, can go to the schools and have the kind of teachers that I think they should, that I want them to, rather than, than uh, the kind of uh, teachers, the kind of schools that somebody up in Washington says they should go to. And I think Governor Wallace can, can give us this kind of government more than anyone else can. I just don't like the way things are going in the country today. You take, uh, oh, I'd say about, uh, was about six years ago? Me and Mr. Murphy were sitting around talking about how bad things were going. At that time, we, I didn't even belong to a, the only thing I belonged to was a union at that time. I didn't belong to any clubs or anything. 
I uh, just didn't feel like a mingler, you know. I didn't want to associate too much with anybody. I didn't want to get too involved in anything. And we happened to be sitting around talking about the different situations that are happening in the country today. And we sort of felt that we had to find some way of getting out there and finding out really what was wrong so that we could bring it to other people what was wrong. What do you think is the biggest attraction that Wallace has? Uh, common sense and uh, easy to understand language. He can talk to the American public without making a complicated uh, situation out of anything. And this is uh, what appeals to me about the man. And uh, He seems to have the answers to most of these problems. Whether he can effectually put it into effect will be something else. But we have a lot of critics today, and they don't dare uh, argue logically. They cannot argue logically with you and me. Because when we say, let the people of California, let the people of South Carolina, let the people of Alabama decide those matters domestic and local, they can't argue with you because there's no argument against it. It's constitutional and it's right. So they got to say we are bigots. They got to say we are hate mongers. They got to say we are fascists. Well, of course, I'm not a bigot, nor a fascist, nor a hate monger, and I'm not a war monger. I am one who believes in the right of local people to determine some things for themselves. And so we... <clears throat> George Wallace's appeal is not the narrow appeal of, uh, of a mere racist demagogue, although that, uh, to a large extent, is the, the root and the secret of it. George Wallace's basic appeal, however, is to something that I would call the instinctive wisdom of a good many Americans. Uh, the instinctive wisdom best uh, exemplified in such phrases as, uh, as uh, kill or be killed, look out for oneself first. Uh, if no one else looks out for you, you'll have to look out for yourself. This kind of wisdom. And it means that George Wallace propounding this kind of wisdom with all the, the force and the, uh, and the sincerity and the considerable wit, the considerable passion that he has about it, uh, makes a very strong uh, appeal to people who feel quite the same way that he does about things. I like to point out that pseudo-intellectual, a lot of them on the Supreme Court, uh, theoreticians uh, uh, that write out theory. I'm talking about the editor of the New York Times uh, uh, who said Castro was a good man and helped bring him to power along with college professors at many of the colleges. Princeton was one where a number of professors had Castro there because he was a great savior of the common people in, uh, in Cuba. But the policemen at Princeton told me they knew that Castro was a communist for talking with him, but not the pseudo-intellectual who had him there. So what I'm saying is that uh, these folks are always mistaken about things and they write the guidelines for the man who isn't mistaken a lot of times. So if there's any guideline writing that ought to be done, it ought to be done by the oil worker and the steel worker and the cab driver. He ought to write the guideline for the pseudo-intellectual instead of the pseudo-intellectual writing the guidelines for him. But I don't think people ought to be writing guidelines for people's lives to the extent they're doing. What I've explained is not explained and is not repeated. Other people are not informed on what they've lost in the way of the right of self-government. They can feel it. They can feel it. They know there's something wrong. They know that Washington uh, is taken over. And frankly, every detail in Washington can interfere by people bent on violating the laws and destroying state and local governments to get away with, with impunity because, because the only ambition of the chief executive and his political organization called the national government is for votes for re-election. And um, they uh, place more importance on the black vote than on government, than on peace and good order, than on law enforcement and observance and respect for the laws. Uh, Johnson is just a political pervert and he has perverted our government to outlaw it. And he's brought about the destruction of our cities by the very people that he's encouraged. You remember the spectacle when he appeared before a joint session of Congress? 
with the accompanying disgrace of the Chief Justice and four other black robe justices of the United States Supreme Court, where Johnson sang the International Communist Song of Hate, which had been adopted by the beatniks, the demonstrators, the rioters, the rebels. We shall overcome. Yes, Congress then and there should have adopted a resolution of impeachment. A farm near Mayville, Wisconsin, a state that gave George Wallace 34% of its votes in the 1964 primary. We like to feel that the liberals are the extremists as far as being on the left side because they want total government control. And anarchy is the extreme on the right side where they want no government. And we're right in the middle where we want government, good, strong, limited government. So really a conservative is, follows the middle of the road. I don't know if I'm very good at convincing anyone why they should vote for Wallace. If anyone is really interested, and I'm pretty sure that most American people are interested in preserving this country of ours, then they would certainly vote for Mr. Wallace rather than voting for some other liberal candidate, which uh, either the Democrats or the Republicans are going to offer a liberal candidate who's going to give away our money and give away our government and give away everything else because they're all good guys. And of course, Mr. Wallace is one of the bad guys. You know, he wants to support or preserve this country, which no good high official really wants to do. They want to be popular in the world. Well, I think that the, uh, the Negro, uh, no doubt about it, has got out of hand. And I think Wallace uh, will enforce law and order. And uh, this is one thing that the people are concerned about. Now, there's no doubt about it that uh, they have uh, uh, burned down Detroit. Uh, they've burnt down the east side over here. And anybody that would uh, say that this is not a problem would be naive. Well, I think the biggest difference that uh, I would be concerned with and I would hope to see is the enforcement of law and order, turning the power of enforcement back over to the individual states. Because it's become a time in, uh, now in all these cities that uh, it's dangerous for people to even leave the doors unlocked. You have to lock your doors. Well, you let the police enforce the law and the National Guard enforce the law in a place like uh, they know how to do. And uh, you may have some things set on fire, but I tell you what, uh, they wouldn't be, you'd have folks scurrying for cover because they know that if they got caught, it's the last of them. There's, there must be something in the, in the climate of the country that... Well, if what's in the climate, we, we've, always had, we've always had uh, revolutionists in this country. We had revolutionists in this country after the, an anarchist in, in 1917 and where they blew up uh, factories and all that kind of, what did they do? They crushed them and put them in jail and put them in an electric chair where people were killed and, uh, and crushed them, which is the way it ought to have been done. They got their civil rights, they, they, were, they were tried and had jury, they were guilty. But now you burn a town down and uh, they sit down and say, if you won't do it again, uh, we will uh, pass some law, we will be lenient. Uh, you've got to enforce the law. And people are tired and sick of... Uh, of anarchists going out here and saying we had a reason uh, to uh, to uh, uh, seriously affect the internal security of this country. When and uh, you can that 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 could uh, that could uh, and and they know it. It could uh, affect the external security of this country. This country could fall uh, and 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 and, lo and become a fifth-rate power uh, by anarchy in the large cities of this nation because. Law enforcement personnel are not allowed to enforce the law. Wallace will appeal very strongly in some of the big industrial states where there is a, a large vote from low economic groups, from working class people who feel themselves directly threatened on the one hand by the Negro's slow emergence from, um, from his old position of being last on the ladder, uh, and who feel themselves on the other hand abused somehow because they see the preponderance of welfare benefits going to the Negro. 
They see a great many things being done for the Negro. After all, they themselves are not that much higher on the economic scale than the Negro is. And they wonder to themselves, why should I have to work 8, 10, 12 hours a day merely to keep my head above water when so often it seems that the Negro merely draws his welfare payment? This isn't at all a true perspective, but in, the, in any case, it's the way many people think. And George Wallace will be thinking the same way and saying the same things. We pray that I would be with the leaders of our country, Lord. Give them wisdom to uh, guide us out of the uh, complacency that we're in today. We pray, Lord, that I would be with the boys in Vietnam, especially for our own boy, Lord, that I would continue to keep thy hand upon him and protect him, Lord. Make this day a blessing to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You, you take a, a picture of Wallace, uh, and this the picture the guy gave me, uh, you can see character in his eyes. You know, he's a... Uh, I don't get fooled too much on people anyway. I, I can uh, pretty well <clears throat> read a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I put him in a, a sort of a category of uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah. Not, not Franklin, but Theodore. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, he's uh, got a little spunk to him, a little backbone, you know. That's what, that's what the American people need. Not without reason that Mrs. Wallace has said of George uh, Wallace that the reason he is so powerful and so, so well regarded in Alabama and elsewhere is because that when they see him on a television program, on Meet the Press or somewhere else, he says what they wish they had the opportunity to say from the same kind of forum. And this is the particular nature of George Wallace's appeal, I think. And because it is that kind of an appeal, because it isn't narrowly addressed merely to racial prejudice or merely to uh, uh, the Hawks and the Vietnam War or merely to any one of another dozen topics that he'll talk about, because it is a broad-gauged appeal, I think he's the most uh, dangerous, or if that's the way you feel, the most hopeful third-party candidate uh, in at least since 1924 when La Follette ran. Mr. Mr. Khrushchev spoke to him, and he got the traditional certificate. And Mr. Castro spoke to him, and they gave it to him. And you know the reason they gave for not giving me the certificate? They said, we don't like Governor Wallace's tactics, but I suppose they like Khrushchev and Castro. And you know what I told the National Press Club? As far as I was concerned, they could take that certificate, and they knew what they could do with it. <clears throat> Webster defines Maverick as an unbranded animal and a person who acts independently. George Wallace has acted independently, but he has worn many brands. Democrat, Southern Democrat, American Independent, Conservative, Populist. Wallace's campaign to reach the little people, the average man, has had the look and feel and weariness of a presidential campaign, but one that, instead of running the course of one summer, has been going on for nearly five years. We want our way to somewhere let's play it again in fact Dixie gets the biggest reception when you play it in Hammond or Milwaukee or anything that's right beautiful sir it should I say it should get Yes, sir, and it does. I mean, <clears throat> in fact, I wouldn't have believed all this myself if I hadn't been up and experienced it three years ago from now on. Like the American Legion Convention in Michigan the other day, if I shoot. Those folks, uh, they think just basically like South Carolinians think. <laughs> Getting ready for Ah, I do Wait a minute. Yeah. 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 Mm, okay. I was thinking I was graduating, I think, that year. When? Yes. Did you put a bit on, on Mr. Kirby when you were Yes. 
and need more schools like Bob James. We're going to have to <coughs> have a look directly at Can you hear me now? I can Governor? hear you now. He had a good speech. What's today? We're stipulating. This is Tuesday. I made a good speech last Tuesday. <laughs> We're stipulating. One of the best I ever heard. <laughs> we oh, they hear good speeches here, but I've been some places where my speech was the best I ever heard. <laughs> <clears throat> Appreciate y'all being out here to meet us. We're always running a little late, but uh, yes, ma'am, that's right. Y'all well, coming on a bit to the hotel with us, aren't you? Yeah. Well, I'll see you folks in a little while. Take these pictures, Dothan. The Honorable George C. Wallace. for Mr. Wallace, and you have already signed, but would you sign again? You remember what happened to our uh, petitions? A lot of them got burned up. Reno and then Washoe here, you know, your address. All right. Everybody that wants a button, right over here. And I want to say in conclusion that you're doing a magnificent job, and I've said many times, that if the police in this country could just run it for about two years, then we could walk in the parks and on the streets in safety. And you are doing it, thank you. Thank you very much. Pretty good, Frank. Like, pretty good to me. Had a good crowd. I don't impress the time. <laughs> and we know that today, if someone molests you on the street, the molester is out of jail before you get in the hospital. And on Monday, they don't try the criminal, they try the policeman. And I say to you that we ought to be very proud of the policeman. talked to the policemen in Princeton when I spoke there recently and they told me that they knew he was a communist by talking with him and looking at him so the police knew but the pseudo intellectuals that know everything they didn't know so the man on the street knows things that these folks don't know that are laying down our guidelines and so I say that every cab driver because I was one in Alabama knew by instinct that old Castro was a communist by just looking at him Oh, wait a moment. Alan, what you doing up here? Well, hi, Charlene. Hi, you, honey. Hi, boy. Glad to see you. Well, that's great country, I tell you, and I appreciate y'all. Hi, Paul. Glad to see you. Yeah, hi. Glad to see you. Glad to see you, partner. The most personal offense intended, you could shake them all up in a sack. A good old cotton picking sack in Alabama. And you could shake them up good and then turn them up in the first one that drops down, regardless of which party you grab it and stick it right back in, because it's just not any different. And the American people are not going to the polls in 1968, but Tennessee's worth the difference. And if they put their ear to the ground in Washington and Alabama and California, they know that there is a growing discontent in its here about big government and preaching socialism and the matter in Vietnam and the breakdown of law and order. 
nationwide basis, uh, I would say that the, uh, the appeal, uh, the skill, uh, the forcefulness, the daring, and the, uh, the uh, uh, persistence of George Wallace is going to make him a very formidable third party candidate, one who might carry several states, who might carry as much as 15% of the popular vote, who might indeed be the decisive factor in the 1968 presidential election. And many of you people that they have never listened to in the past and won't listen to in the future once this movement concludes or gets over, have a chance today to have an impact on national affairs never in the history of your lifetime. You never have had it, I've never had it, and we'll never have it again. And so I say to you that if you will help us, and we're going to be on most all this ballots in the, in the, in the country, there's only two states that it's difficult to get on, and that's California and Ohio. And it wouldn't be fatal if you didn't get on, but we are going to get on, in my judgment, ballots in both of those states. And then in 1968, if they don't give you and me a choice, if you will help us get on the ballot and they don't give us a choice, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll come back to Oregon, and you and me together, we'll stir something up in this country. Thank you very much. George Wallace said on Thursday he was through traveling for a while and his campaign would be staged from Montgomery, where he is now with PBL correspondent Tom Pettit. Governor, I've not seen a man enjoy a movie so much in recent times. Do you think this uh, film is an accurate representation of the George Wallace you know, or was it a little too soft? On well, you? it's uh, pretty hard uh, to portray the entire spectrum in uh, 30 or 40 minutes, but uh, I think it... Uh, uh, was pretty uh, characteristic. You think it'd make a fair campaign film for you? I think it might make a good campaign film. You think you'll have it shown in Alabama on the educational stations of Alabama? Well, of course, uh, they don't operate on Sunday night, but I'm sure that they will. I'm sure, of course, that they would uh, show the other film of the other candidates themselves. <clears throat> but I hope so anyway. You'll have this film shown in Alabama, will you? I, I think that uh, it will be shown, yes. I think we'll show it. Who would you like to see as vice president? Well, <clears throat> we are discussing uh, the vice presidential uh, spot at the moment, uh, and we're going to decide this week. I'd rather not mention any names and, uh, uh, because we have uh, told the uh, two people that we are discussing this matter with at the moment that we would not uh, mention their names prematurely. Southern? <clears throat> well, uh, we are talking to one non-Southerner and uh, one Southerner public office holders? Uh, and no, they're not public office holders. Uh, uh, they might have been uh, in the past, uh, but uh, they're two good men. I don't think geography means <clears throat> anything anymore. I don't think people in Oregon or Washington, uh, New Hampshire, care about whether, where a man's from. You know, for the last 100 years almost, there has been that uh, 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 difficulty of geography insofar as a southerner was concerned, but uh, that has been swept away. And today people do not care <clears throat> where the candidate's from or the vice presidential candidate's from. They only think about uh, the philosophy and what he stands for. Governor, let, <coughs> me, let me clear something up with you if I can. Uh, you've been asked this before, but when you were uh, released from the Air Force in 1945, you began drawing a $10 a month disability pension <coughs> for damaged nerves. Are you no, still drawing the $10 a I'd month? I'd be glad uh, for that, uh, my service record to be shown. Uh, I had, uh, it said uh, when they put me in the hospital for what they call combat fatigue, which uh, 
thousands of people in the uh, land forces uh, went from the South Pacific to Australia to rest. Thousands of Air Force men who had flown, uh, uh, who became a little anxious in their flying and a little nervous from flying, they grounded them uh, when they came back and gave them a rest. And so I was grounded, I think, for three months uh, to take uh, a rest in the hospital, and I took vitamin shots, and my entire record shows that I was to recuperate, to recover physically. So to those, uh, Senator Morris uh, was given my service record by somebody in the Veterans Administration, which is typical of what will happen to you if you dare to attack big government. I think that's one thing they'll do. Well, Governor, They took you... my service record, which uh, was supposed to have been secret, and gave it to the Senator. And he got up on the floor of the Congress and uh, revealed it. But I have a, <coughs> I draw 10% disability from uh, this. You still uh, draw it now? Yes, I still draw now. I think after you've drawn a certain number of years, I think under the law you automatically. But I'd like to point out that uh, the government of the United States says I'm 90% okay. That is an A rating. I'd like for some of these folks who uh, uh, criticize me to be checked themselves by the government and uh, see what they would make. I don't know whether they'd make 90 or not, but at least I know what I made. I am uh, in the class A class as far as... Uh, uh, my uh, ability, uh, physical and mental abilities are concerned. How much money a month do you draw? I think it's $21. I'm going to use it in this campaign for the presidency. Senator Morris uh, showed my record. Of course, my condition uh, came about uh, from being shot at during World War II in combat. I don't know what he attributes his condition to. Uh, somebody said he was kicked in the head by a horse one time. I really shouldn't say those things, but I do resent the fact that... Uh, my record, uh, which was, uh, I have no objection to it being shown. I, they just asked me my uh, permission to do so. Governor, under certain circumstances, do you think that uh, looting and arson should be made capital offenses? Well, you're talking about looting and arson? Well, arson in uh, many states uh, is a capital offense. If you burn a dwelling down, a building down that's inhabited, uh, you'll find a number of states that uh, is a capital offense and you could get the electric chair. Uh, very few people get uh, the capital punishment for robbery in many states is a capital offense uh, uh, where you uh, put a man in fear of his life or limb uh, to rob him. I'm not talking about, and first degree burglary in many states uh, is a capital offense where you break in the, and enter a house in the nighttime with the intent to commit a felony. So uh, arson in many states is already a felony. You mean I mean, it's already a capital offense. And you agree with that? I agree with it in the sense that, uh, of course, no one gets uh, the life, uh, gets uh, the electric chair for arson unless somebody is killed, and of course, in a, <coughs> in a, in a fire. But uh, what are you getting around? Do you get around to talking about the breakdown of law and order and riots? Well, no, I'm just asking <clears throat> you if you think that looting should be made a capital offense. No, I don't think. Uh, I do know the old common law. I believe it's a common law. It re really, it's been the law in this country, I suppose, at least uh, by general usage, that uh, when you had tornadoes or floods in the past, of course, the orders always went out to shoot looters. Do you agree with that? I agree that looters ought to be shot, yes. On sight? On sight. Uh, in, in a riot. Uh, uh, in a riding condition, looters should be shot. Uh, if that was uh, made clear, then there wouldn't be any looting. Now, we had an instance here in Alabama where we put out the word when they shot at some police officers and looked like they were going to start a riot, that looters would be shot. Uh, the National Guard uh, general uh, made that statement, and the state police. As a, con a consequence of this uh, uh, tough statement, no one was shot. No one was hurt. There wasn't anything to it. Uh, law and order prevailed. And in Selma, Alabama, that they've talked so much about, and by the way, my wife got nearly all of the Negro vote at Selma, which is a matter of public record that you can see while you're in Alabama. And I showed it to one of the top columnists in the country the other day. My wife got uh, uh, 85 to 87 and a half percent in the all Negro ward at Selma. Governor, uh, the uh, point I'm trying to make is we didn't have any breakdown of law and order there. We didn't have the burning down of the city. And that's a reason that some of the liberals said we suppress people uh, in the city. But the Negro and white citizen of this state and the overwhelming majority of Negro and whites in the country are against the breakdown of law and order. And so when you ask me the question, and others do, you say, does that have racial overtones? 
when has it got in the, gotten to be in this country that when you talk about law and order, it has racial overtones? Don't you think it does? It has to this extent that a number of Negroes, a small minority of the Negro citizens, were involved in rioting and looting. But the overwhelming majority of the Negro citizens of this country are against that as much as you and me. And I would say that actually it doesn't have racial overtones and so far as I am concerned, it has criminality overtones. All right, let me ask you about Vietnam. <clears throat> Do you think that nuclear weapons should be used to conclude the war in Vietnam? I don't uh, advocate the use of nuclear weapons at all. I think we should uh, uh, use uh, conventional weapons. Uh, and I think that if, uh, I believe, the, if the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, maybe it can... Uh, and uh, maybe have uh, a more say in the military uh, solution that we could have a military solution to, to the war in Vietnam. At if, least I'm hopeful of that. If you were president, would you give them a complete free hand? No, I wouldn't give the military a complete free hand because that's not our form of government. Uh, we should not abdicate the civilian responsibility to the military. I said that I would lean heavily upon the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I recognize there are diplomatic and political considerations in Southeast Asia. And uh, uh, I'm conscious of that fact. I do think that we can probably get to a political solution and a diplomatic solution quicker by uh, uh, pressing the military. Governor, how do you get your facts and information about Vietnam? From the Huntley Brinkley Report or the oh, New yes, York Times? Oh, yes, I get it from the Huntley. I ring, I re, I've read even the New York Times magazine supplement. Uh, I've read a number of books on Vietnam. I, can't, I forgot the author one that I have uh, at the house at the moment. I have read uh, thousands upon thousands, millions of words, I suppose, of the Associated Press, United Press. I've read uh, 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 magazine articles. I've read the magazine sections of the larger newspapers in the country, including the New York Times. I've, uh, well, of course, I've read the columnists uh, for, uh, I read about the same as you do, I suppose. To whom do you look for intellectual guidance? Whose opinions do you respect? Well, I read, uh, I read uh, diverse columns, and the columnists, if that's what you're talking about, that's what, you, that what you're well, trying who, to get at. Wh whose opinions in this country do you respect? And well, I respect uh, many of those uh, opinions of those in government. Like uh, who, sir? Well, I, I listen to the opinions of members of the United States Senate. Well, who? Uh, well, Senator Richard Russell of Georgia, for one. Uh, Senator Stennis, for one. I listened, uh, even, even though I'm not in agreement with Senator McCarthy, I listen to Senator McCarthy because he has a viewpoint. I listen to Senator Robert Kennedy. I don't uh, agree much with Senator Kennedy on the matter of Vietnam, but I have listened to, uh, uh, to Mendel Rivers. I've read Drew Pearson. I've read William White. I read Holmes Alexander. I read Tom Wicker, who's been on this program. Uh, I read uh, many people's viewpoints who are diverse because there is no columnist nor no politician nor the president uh, who knows a simple solution to this complex problem. You've asked me who I've read and listened to. I've had uh, the pleasure of doing something that probably the columnists happened. I've had a classified and confidential briefing with other governors by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Mr. McNamara and Mr. Rusk, uh, on three different occasions. Do you get any advice from college professors? Uh, yes, I talked to some college professors. Uh, you don't, think much many. Of, you don't think much of intellectuals generally. No, no you see, y y your question uh, points up the, uh, uh, the sonification of really the ignorance of my position. I don't mean to say you're ignorant of my position, but generally by some of these intellectuals, you're talking pseudo-intellectuals. Well, I'm talking about the pseudo-intellectual. I'm not talking about the true intellectual that I consider a true intellectual, and that's a matter of judgment because there are some who think uh, and say that I'm a demagogue. Some writers say that, but because I say those writers are writing demagogues. The true intellectual uh, is a man who has some wisdom and knowledge. Well, Governor... Uh, the pseudo-intellectual is a man who mimics what other people write, and he memorizes it, and he has some knowledge. And then he doesn't have much common sense. Governor, you've said a lot of things about intellectuals and pseudo-intellectuals. Oh, pseudo-intellectuals. All right. Well, in fairness to both the pseudo-intellectuals and the intellectuals, we've asked three men to our studios in New York City. James McPherson, professor of American history at Princeton University. James Billington, professor of history and international affairs, Princeton University. Richard Cloward, professor of sociology, Columbia University. Now, Governor, would you tell these men why you are so suspicious 
of intellectuals. I'm not suspicious of intellectuals, uh, not at all. I think that uh, this country needs intellectuals. This country is great because of the uh, intellectual uh, contributions uh, in all uh, uh, mm -hmm. walks of life in our country, politics, science, uh, government. Uh, I'm not against intellectuals at all. I have no suspicion of intellectuals. I'm talking about the man that I judge as a pseudo-intellectual, a false intellectual. Whether that's an apt description for them or apt description to you, I'm not sure. And if you want to know the definition of what I'm talking about a pseudo-intellectual, I'm talking about one, uh, for instance, uh, uh, who marches in the streets and assaults the Pentagon. Uh, could uh, you name one? No, I can't name any, but I read some of them. If I'd have known you was going to ask that question, yes, I could have given you the names. They had names in the paper of different professors. I was at uh, Dartmouth one night speaking, and a junior college professor led the charge down the aisle saying, kill him, kill him. Uh, I don't remember his name, but he was a junior college professor, and his name's been in the paper. I'm talking about the professor at Rutgers that advocated... Uh, communist victory and an impassioned plea. I long for a communist victory. I'm talking about the one at uh, Berkeley that made a speech that went all over the world that let us raise a freedom brigade to go fight the American imperialist soldiers. I call that a pseudo-intellectual. Right. Now, since you've asked me that question, I'd be glad to get you the names of some of these people. I don't remember the names uh, and didn't know you were going to ask me. But they have marched in the streets. They marched right here in Alabama in the Selma Parade and stood up in front of our capital and applauded uh, everything this uh, different people said, uh, like Joan, uh, the, the, the singer, that said she wouldn't sing for the American truth, but she'd sing for the Viet. I call that a group. And three of them from the University of Alabama right. marched in the parade. One of them was named... Uh, Governor, I'm going to have to interrupt you because the three gentlemen in New York <clears throat> want to defend the name of the intellectual in the American academic community. and. Professor Bellington has a question for you, sir. Yes, sir, Professor. Well, sir, uh, <clears throat> I don't know whether we're intellectuals or pseudo-intellectuals, but I want to welcome you to the family if you've read that many millions of words and uh, <clears throat> uh, talked to so many people. Uh, <clears throat> I might begin on the question of international affairs. Uh, you seem to uh, talk a good deal about um, <clears throat> authority of the police and deferring to the judgment of the military in uh, uh, Vietnam. I wonder if you're aware in the area of uh, uh, communist matters, which you say you've read, which I have some exposure, um, how divided and fractious internally this communist world is and how much, in many ways, they seem to count, as they always historically have under Lenin and under Stalin, uh, on having a kind of negative rallying point somebody who <clears throat> personifies a kind of uh, stubborn conservatism and uh, reliance on, on force measures, which always increases, uh, historically has increased, the role of the uh, violent revolutionary prone alternatives as distinct from the harmonious evolutionary uh, factors. Are you uh, aware of this historical? Pretty, pretty deep for me, Professor. Frankly, I, I really it's not too clear to me. Uh, uh, you are saying that I might be a rallying point for uh, the, the communists, is that what you mean? Well, I'd say they give you a great deal of attention in their press as a figure. Well, I, I'm glad they do because I'm very much anti-communist. Uh, uh, if, you, if you think that I'm advocating uh, complete military uh, measures in the war in Southeast Asia, of course I'm not. I said I would lean heavily upon the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and I recognize that there is a fight for uh, the hearts and minds of the people of Vietnam and the pacification program that evidently has taken some setback in the recent uh, terrorist activities of the Viet Cong. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I know they probably pay a lot of attention to me. I know they came out against me a time or two. And uh, No, I don't think it's so much that they come out against almost everything, but <clears throat> there's a question of the value of having someone to... Uh, Exhuming more and more prominence in our national life, for instance, in talking to the vast, um, uncommitted two-thirds of the world, which is non-white, and talking uh, to the uh, various fractious elements of the communist world, <coughs> which Professor is... Professor Bellington, I believe your colleague, Professor McPherson, has a question that he uh, would, would really like to get I would like to, to, I would like to comment on that. Uh, you mentioned that two-thirds of the uh, world is non-white. Now, I want to say this. I'm not anti-Negro and never made a statement in my life that I considered reflection upon 
uh, Negroes because of who they are, because God made them as they are, made me as I Have am. Have you ever communicated with any of these uh, any of these Negro leaders? Oh, oh yes, in I the African world and the Asian uh, no, world, not non-white in the, not, leaders. Not, not in the African. Yes, I have. I, I I've had Negro uh, uh, newsmen. Uh, and some uh, consular officials who have visited my office from different places, Liberia, Niger, Nigeria. No, I haven't had too much uh, talk with them, no. Uh, and what you're trying to say is that we should uh, uh, determine our attitude in this country by talking to people in Asia and Africa. I'm not saying Africa. that at all, uh, Governor Wallace. I was <clears throat> suggesting that there's a real problem here. On this matter of Vietnam and on the matter of relying on the military, many people feel and incidentally, I don't think in our country uh, there's much distinction between intellectuals and the various other peoples of the world. We have more people going to the universities than any country in the world per capita, and there's a sort of identity. I, I've talked to many policemen. I would just say that uh, although I was not at Princeton when Castro visited there, your statement that professors had Castro there because he was a great savior of the common people in Cuba is not true. They had him there because they were studying revolution very scientifically and were very deeply concerned <clears throat> over analyzing causes, and he was a living example with whom they were anxious to talk. But let me ask you this question, sir. Uh, <clears throat> many people feel that it's, pri it's the reliance <clears throat> on that there's a mistaken <clears throat> conception of... Professor, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Could you state the question very succinctly? Because the, I... Uh, uh, <laughs> all right, sir. You good professors sort of... <laughs> I can't hardly get your question, gentlemen, but uh, go ahead. Uh, Two-thirds of the... Co of the uh, well, Governor, Governor let, let him finish all right. Let me all just, right, sir. Let me just, let me just finish this. <laughs> I wish we had more time. Many people feel that it's lack of links with the people to whom you thought that is our main difficulty in Southeast Asia and not excessive reliance on military measures that bombing people into negotiation is a fundamental mistake in the, anal in the analysis of people, uh, and that <clears throat> the uh, misconception, uh, the basic misconception about we're merely fighting an irregular form of regular warfare rather than mm -hmm. an integrated political revolutionary war, which most analysts believe is 80% political, requires more attention to the political and to the people uh, in this part of the world as well. All I right, agree Governor, how would you categorize him? Characterize who? Professor Bellington, intellectual or pseudo? Well, I think the, those gentlemen intellectuals, uh, if I ever see them marching in a parade in front of Alabama's capital, I'll call them pseudo intellectuals. But until they do that, I'm okay. They, they, they are very intelligent uh, uh, people and uh, they're intellectuals. I say they're intellectuals. All right, Professor they, McPherson, please. They look, they look good, too. Governor Wallace, I might be afraid to come to march in Alabama because I checked up on the crime rate in Alabama and found that it. In 1965, you had the highest murder yes, rate sir. in the country. We the surely did. I think we had one of the highest. And I want to say to you, Professor... Could you let him that, finish uh, the question, Governor? Uh, uh, go ahead. I can answer that. Well, well I also checked into the, uh, the assault rate, the aggrega aggravated assault rate, which yeah, was the fourth high. highest in the country. Pretty high, yes. Sir. I was wondering how yes, you sir. as president uh, would bring uh, law and order to the, go the country when you were not able to do so to Alabama. Well, let me say that uh, I'm sorry that this is the case. But if you will check the breakdown of the assault and uh, murder cases, you will find that there are very, we have small percentages of white murder and white, small percentages of white murder and Negro, and small percentages of Negro murder and white. But we have a large...